Welcome. I'm a scrubby farm kid. Um, they, uh, when we put that label professor on the top of uh, people, it sometimes chases people away. But um, the truth of, uh, of who I am is uh, this. My dad was a shearing contractor, and he worked in the shearing sheds of Puahui and um, Pukiatu and Arahina and Naroma, which you've never heard of. You know, and not many people outside of those places have heard about it. But uh, this, is, uh, this is me. This is my twin sister, and this is my next sister. And um, we were kind of hoha kids, who were kind of kids who were never expected to do very much because in Pukiato, what you did was you went back to work on the farm. But my mum and dad believed in education. My dad had left school at 12. Mum had been asked to leave at 15. So um, th they spent their life investing in opening a door, in trying to make sure that their kids could get some choices. And, um, but there was a bit of a problem with it. Um, when I was in year 12, I got expelled. And uh, I got expelled from Te Aumutu College along with my twin sister. And that brought uh, all these dreams down. Which it looked like it was going to bring these dreams down in a crash. And uh, basically, the background was this. We used to have um, uh, ANZAC services at the school. And, uh, and the idea was that everybody would come in, all the kids would come into the ANZAC services and the RSA would come in. But um, back in the 70s, I need to date this, like I turned 60 in one month's time. So it's a long way back. But, but back in the 1970s, um, the peace movement was there. And we were hippies, but we had our hair cut short because we weren't allowed it long at school. But we thought we were hippies. And, uh, and we decided that we would, uh, we would protest against having to turn up to the compulsory ANZAC service. And so... Um, I, I went home at night and made some poppies, and we stole some Indian ink from the art room and painted them black. And we were going to sell them for 20 cents each for the peace movement. Well, tell me that went down like a bucket of cold sick. But anyway, we were, we were standing up there on the, on the big field in front of the school, and uh, we had a little tray and a jam jar with a hole in it to put the 20 cents in, and um, a row of little poppies. And the cool kids from year 12 were standing there with poppies too. So there were about six or seven of us. And um, my sister had written this poem, tragic poem, terrible poem, but bless her, I mean, she, she died a couple of years ago, so if she's listening, I'm sorry. But, um, but you now it was like full of that, you know, adolescent puffed up pride about, oh, I bought your blood red poppy and painted it death black, you child who sells the poppy, paint your soul like that. It went on and on and on. Anyway, but we were, we were proud. And, uh, and we'd, we'd sold 60 cents worth of poppies. It wasn't going well, the business didn't have a great infrastructure, but we, were, we, we thought we were doing really well. And then the principal came walking across the field. And you know when principals put that kind of smile on their face that, knows, that looks like death? You know, you know the teeth are just sharpened in underneath it. And he, he walked over and this extraordinary thing happened. It was the first time I'd ever experienced it. The other kids melted. They disappeared. The poppies came off and there was just my sister and I standing there. And we thought, oh, Shit. Anyway, he, um, <laughs> or he actually did think that, that was the exact word, but anyway, he looked at the poem and then looked at us with those peculiar glassy eyes and in one movement he tipped over the tray, the money fell down on the ground and while I was scrambling trying to pick up the 20 cent pieces he told us we were expelled. And so um, we were supposed to be sent home but um, Pukiatu, a long way away from Te Oumutu, it was an hour bus ride and the bus wasn't leaving until 3.30. So uh, he said to us, all right, um, after we got a dressing gown down, he said, um, this, uh, you can, if you want to stay at school, you can overturn this. You take off your poppies and you go into that, um, you go into the assembly. And we were scared. We were scared because our mum and dad had done everything for us to get this chance. And here it was in a bad state. And, um, but we said no because we believed, my great uncles died in concentration camps in Dachau. We believed that war wasn't right under any circumstance. And even though we were kids and we didn't know how to change things properly, we still felt in our heart we were right, that it should be a choice. And um, bless Te Oumutu College, they didn't think that. So we were made to stand at the doorway coming into the hall. All the kids were inside, and they brought the RSA in between us, and they told them what we'd done. And we felt stink, terrible. 
And because uh, they kept, they looked at us, and you could see a mixture of disgust and bewilderment. And we were trying really hard not to cry. And we were standing, and I was looking at my sister across this group of people coming in. And I just thought, what the hell are we going to do? And um, so the bus comes at 3.30, uh, th and we get on. We go out home. It was a, 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 a 4K ride on our bike back to the farm. Get to the farm. We're pushing our bikes up the hill. And, oh, God, there's Mum and Dad standing at the top of the hill. Dad had come up from the uh, milking shed. And we thought, oh, because you know, this is a small community. Everybody knows within 10 seconds of something happening that the Yings twins just got expelled from school. And, um, and my mum and dad did taught me the first great lesson of my life. And it was going to shape what being a scholar is, which is what you are about to become. They, um, mum stepped forward as mum always steps forward. And she said, um, you know, you didn't change anything. And you hurt a lot of people. And you showed disrespect. We thought, and each one of those comments, we sort of went down another notch. And, uh, and then uh, we put our bikes down, and then, uh, then Dad said this. He said, um, we don't agree with what you've done, but at least my kids had the courage to stay standing when everybody else deserted them because they believed in an idea. And then they held us, and we started crying. And I learned something from that. I learned that if we take risks over the things that we believe in, we've got to have two things. You've got to be really clear about what this is that we believe in, and you've got to have people who love you, because sometimes things are going to be rough. And you're stepping in now to university. And for lots of us, when we come into university, we go, um, maybe I shouldn't be here. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe this is all, yeah. Or maybe I'm going to disappoint my parents or my family or these people who have given so much for me to be here. Maybe I'm not going to live up to it. And we suffer loneliness and we suffer fear. And when I look at the mentors up here and I, I, I heard the spirit in the room, I kept thinking, well, at least that one's different for you guys. Because there are people here who love you. There are people here who believe that if you're going to get through, you've got to have people at your shoulder. You've got to have people who are going to have your back because if you're any good as a scholar, you're going to take risks. It's not just about finding out what the assessment criteria is and then ticking off some box. If you're going to be great, if you're going to not just be world leading but world changing, you're going to be out on your own sometimes. You're going to be taking risks. And so, um, and I'll let me jump. Part of that is a way of thinking. When, um, when we go through secondary school with the, you know, with the NCEA and its emphasis on um, performing stuff and, and demonstrating that you can do stuff, oftentimes what we learn is to find out the criteria and then map, map up against that. You all had to, you all, the fact that you're sitting here shows that you could do it in one way or another. You go, oh, so what are the learning criteria? What are the criteria? What are the outcomes? What is it that you need me to do? But that is not thinking. That is just following formula. And university, if you look at the root of the word, it comes from the same root as universal, to mean to embrace everything, which means it's more than just pattern thinking. I would argue that it's actually disobedient thinking. And disobedient thinking is when your thinking has got you into a cul-de-sac, a dead end, and you go, um, I can't find my way out, you've got one or two choices. You either go, well, that was tough, and you sit down and do nothing, or you go, bugger this. Wow, that's power. Um, bugger this. And you disobey the rituals and formulas that got you to that point, and you try something else. And that is essentially what creative thinking is. Not, not necessarily associated with the arts. It, it's when you are capable of looking at something and finding a new way around it. So the idea of creative thinking is a really interesting one because up until uh, um, about two, two and a half centuries ago, the word didn't really, it wasn't really used in schools. It was used in theology. It was used in religion. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That was what gods did. What you did, what we did, was we understood or we um, could apply stuff or we could break it down and reorder it, but we couldn't draw something into being from nothing. And then the first of the romantic poets started talking about, they go, yeah, yeah, I can. I can. I can go where there's nothing and pull something into being. I can create. 
But this creativity, so we got it tangled up with people like artists and writers and poets, but great scientists create, great business people, great leaders exist on their ability to create ways forward where other people haven't seen it. So when you're, um, when you're, you, you're um, in a second story apartment and you drop your trousers off the deck and you go, well, I'm not running down there in my undies, you've got one of two choices. You either go, I stay inside for the rest of my life, or you create. <laughs> okay. In other words, you disobey the ritual and the, 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 the formula that says the way to fix this is to run downstairs and hope that nobody sees me when I grab my pants. Or if you've got your first car off Trade Me and that blew your whole budget and it doesn't have a very good locking system and you <laughs> create. Right? So you intellectually disobey the formula. Or you're cooking and uh, and uh, you've got only two sets of arms and you've got about five requirements at the same time and you can't necessarily keep the book open. Okay, so this is a beautiful thing. And sometimes you'll hear academics talking about that thought is a beautiful thing, that knowledge is a beautiful thing and the ability to work with it is a beautiful thing. So, and sometimes we play with this because if you notice when you saw those images, you laughed or you smiled. We recognize creativity as a positive and a beautiful thing. We recognize it. So when you design a park in Ghent for a, um, just to give people pleasure, this is pleasurable. Okay? It disobeys, but it creates wonderment because of it. Or you've got a student cafe and you've got a budget of six bucks to create a branding, and you do this. So this is the thinking, this is the thinking that pushes you from the realm of being a student to being a scholar because you can generate new knowledge. So you know, oftentimes in, in, when you're at secondary school, what you had to do was work out what the teacher wanted and then produce that. But at university, you're asked to think, uh, to create new thinking. So you don't just spend your time imitating what's there, but you ask, we heard it before, you ask questions to try and make new knowledge because that is your gift. In, in, the, in the concept of, of Louvre, that is what you give back to the world that enabled you to be here. You give your thinking back. So as scholars, we're not flash people who walk around with letters after our names. We are servants of the world that put us here. Our job is to try and make that world better. And we can't do it by just recycling what's there. We have to use this great gift that we've given to make new knowledge, to give new knowledge, to give new insights, to give new understanding. This is Ralph Kaplan, and I, I think this is really lovely. He said this, he said, you know, one of the hallmarks of you as a creative person is that you have the ability to tolerate what's ambiguous or dissonant, inconsistency. You can deal with stuff that's out of place. But one of the rules of a well-run corporation is that you've got to minimalize surprise. Now, that's what a lot of schools do. And what the education goes, look, look, do the formula. Don't bring in this other hairy stuff because it might not work. But, you know, if we didn't have this, nothing worth reading would get written, nothing worth seeing would get painted, nothing worth living with would, be, would ever be designed. It would be tedious. And yet, your brain is what is capable of it. So, if you have a look at this. Alan Fletcher says this, that your creativity is actually a compulsive urge. It's an ordinary thing that you do. It's a thing that your brain will automatically do until you shut it down. And it demands more than ritual actions or routine responses. And it's only valid when you're on risky ground, when you're working beyond what you know is safe. And I'm going to show you an example of it. I'm, uh, I'm going to tell you a story. But the bugger is I'm only going to stop halfway through. And I'm going to ask you a question part of the way through. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you stand up and mime. It's just a question, and you can't get it wrong, but it will show you something extraordinary about yourself. So this story is a very, very old Jewish story. And uh, it's about King Solomon. Now you may have, how many of you heard of King Solomon? Just roughly, few, okay. So he's famous for being a famous judge or a wise man. But this is not the story that you will know about the babies being held up and threatened to be cut in half. This is another story. There was a woman, and she, when she was young, she had been married to a nomadic tribe. 
And so she left Jerusalem, and she was only 14. And until the age of 28, she had lived with this nomadic tribe, but the, par the mother-in-law didn't like her. She had had three children, but when her husband died, the family said, take the children and go back. And she said, but I have no family left in Jerusalem. And what am I going to do for money? And they gave her five copper coins. That's barely enough to buy food. And she set out. And she walked through the desert with her two children towards Jerusalem. And the moon was like a blind eye in the sky. And these three figures were walking through the sand dunes and across old trodden paths to a place that she didn't know she would be able to protect and look after her children. And in her pocket, she kept feeling the five coins. And finally, as dawn came, they came up to the top of a hill and they looked down on this amazing city. And it had huge gates made of the cedars of Lebanon. And she looked at it, and she looked at her two kids, and she felt that big. She was really afraid. Now, under Jewish law, if you have family in a city, they must give you shelter for one day and one night. And she thought, well, at worst, I can try and find a distant relation. But she only had a, di a very vague sense of where they were living. And so she took her two children and she said, we have to be brave. There's no room for us to be weak. We don't have any other choice. We have to be brave and trust that we will find a way forward. And they walked down into the city and everyone could tell that they were from out in a nomadic tribe. Their clothing was, was, was different. It was ragged. There was nothing stylish or cool about it. The kids were frightened. They were tucked in close against her. And she went into the great marketplace. And the marketplace was alive with colour because this place was on the trade routes. They had spices and they had perfumes and they had fabrics. All these amazing things laid out. And she went round each stall and she asked for work. And they said, well, what can you do? And she said, well, I can, I can um, grade wool. And they went, well, that's not much good. Do you know how to count money? No, but I've got two children to feed. Yeah, yeah, tough. So all day she went from one store to the next, to the next, to the next. And she was offered nothing. And as the shadows began to creep across the market and the dust settled from people leaving and the merchants started folding down the awnings of their tents across the goods, she was realised that she had enough money to buy food for one night at the most. But when she'd gone through the stalls and she'd looked at the cost of food, she realised that the five Five copper coins would only buy one cake, one piece of bread for the three of them. She had been offered work. She'd been offered work as a prostitute. But she said, I won't, I won't do that. I won't do that. I've got my kids to look after. There's some way that, I will, that I'll get by. And she started walking around the streets to try and find her relatives. Now, I want to stop for a moment. She's standing in the corner of the marketplace, and her two children are beside her. It's getting dark. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. I'm going to ask you to look at something. Have a look at her two children. Have a look at what they're wearing on their feet. Have a look at their clothing. Have a look at their hair. Have a look at the marketplace around them. Where they're standing in relationship to it. Now open your eyes. I'm going to ask you a question. You can't get it wrong. Looking at the two children, how many of you saw two boys? One, two, three, four. Okay. How many of you saw two girls? How many of you saw a boy and a girl? Now, I never told you that. You created that. You created that as a natural consequence of listening to a story. In fact, the market that you saw and you saw and you saw and you saw were all different. The colours in them were different. Some of you saw it in great detail. Some of you saw it as a vague impression with a couple of little details. You all created, without thinking, but you were, you automatically created and built onto the story. You co-created with a story. It was normal. You weren't putting the gear into fast forward to do it. It was normal for you. It's the most precious gift that you mentally have beyond all the calculation, all the other stuff. That is your greatest gift. Your ability to draw into being from nothing. I, I just um, I was listening to some of the journeys that uh, 
some of the people up here had made some of your mentors. And uh, when you know how much work is sitting behind that, and people go, oh, I've just finished such, five, just finished such and such a degree, you go, that's massive. That's, that's massive. So we might make light of it, but there's a lot of work. I've just worked with somebody, she's actually now uh, working out here, um, who came in on a certificate program. And uh, she was the first person from her family to go to university. And, um, and she, she designed a new way of printing natu. These are ceiling to floor portraits of women in her family. And she looked at the concept of vetalatala as a new, for a new form of documentary making about Tongan women who had left their homeland to settle in another place. It was all new. It was all new. And she was on the road without a road map. And that's what great research is, that you'll find yourself sometimes there without a road map. And so you have to have the courage. And you have to have people who support you. And you, they need to look after you, but you need to look after them too. Because they are vital. You're never going to see them in the list of things that you need the most at university. But they're huge. So. My, my argument is that when you come to, um, I've, um, I, I, love, I love my job, I love my job. And um, because I get to work with incredible thinking. And normally from people who don't realize how incredible their thinking is. But after years of teaching, I think I've, I think I've realized this. You know, in the comic books, you see people sitting there and they've got an angel on one side and a devil on the other. Temptation and kind of boring advice, no, good advice. Okay. But, what I really think we have when we go into learning is something else. On one side, we have, we have fear. We go, maybe I'm going to make an idiot of myself. Maybe I'm going to let down people. You know, maybe um, I'm not going to be able to do this. That's sitting there. We might not say it, but that's sitting there. You know, maybe... Um, um, maybe I, I suffer from depression sometimes, or maybe I get, um, I'm not the golden person that everybody thinks I am. Maybe I'm going to get exposed. Fear. On the other side is hope. And we hope, we hope we're going to be able to do this thing. We hope we're going to be able to bring something into being that we are proud of, that we know is worth something. That has been, we hope that it will extend us, that we will become a richer person because of it. We hope that it will be use, and we hope that it, w it will be valued, and so will we. And we juggle those two things together. And that's actually what learning is. So it's normal to feel afraid, and it's normal to hope, and it's normal to create. So I'm going to jump some stuff. I'm going to jump some stuff to this. There's a, there's, I'm going to show you a picture in a moment. And there's a reason for this. In, under New Zealand law, there are five definitions of a university, or five things that a university have to do, has to do. But the last one is a really interesting one. It is that you are expected to be, the strange term, a critic and conscience of society. In other words, beyond studying, you're expected to be a better person and make society better. Now, that has a cost. That has a cost. And um, a couple of years ago, I was in Berlin. And um, I was standing outside a university that was very famous. But um, on May the 10th, 1933, they fired one third of their staff. They lost their jobs. They burned 20,000 books. Doctorates, degrees were taken off people. Why? What have these people done that was so terrible? They thought against the state. National Socialism had risen, and these people were arguing against it. They were using their scholarship as a critic and conscience of society. They were saying, look, I can see this is not right, and they wouldn't shut up. So they got fired. Their books were burned. Some of them were sent into, ex uh, into exile, and some of them were put into concentration camps. Today, if you go to that university in the marketplace where this happened, there's this big uh, 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 cobblestone area and a glass box that you look down into and there are shelves where 20,000 books might once have existed. And the students have a book fair there every Friday where they sell books super cheap. Now, 
If you look at yourself as being more than a student and being a scholar, if that's what you aspire to, and some of you do, you're not just here to tick books, boxes. There is a belief inside that you might become a better person and a better person in society. I'm going to leave you with this. There was a famous academic in Germany. Academics did a terrible thing. They did not, many of them did not speak out when the Nazi party was gathering power. Ideologically, they didn't. And a famous um, minister, um, Martin Neumoller, he said this. He said, first, you know, they came for the socialists, but I didn't speak out because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews, but I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was nobody left to speak. Our job is to watch and heal and help and make society better. But every time we remain silent, or every time we opt to just copy what we think will be safe, we betray the thing that we actually represent as scholars. So, but don't worry, I'm not going to tell you how the story ends because we don't have time. But, so, Oscar Wilde said this. Our hope is so much that you've given up your holiday to be here because you hope that by coming to university you may do something good. You may honour your family, you may honour your society, you may make yourself a better person. And to do that we have to dream. We have to dream, we have to believe in something. And he said this of you. He said, a dreamer is somebody who can only find their way by moonlight. And their punishment? Well, their punishment is that they see the dawn before the rest of the world. You'll be okay, guys. Thank you.